Hey, everybody, I'm Elizabeth Alfano, and it's the Plant Based Business Hour live every Tuesday and Thursday, right here. I have a fantastic show for you today. Author and Harvard business professor Max Bazerman joins me to discuss his new book, Better Not Perfect. In fact, is it possible to better your bottom line by making the compassionate choice? So, we're going to get into it. Uh, before we do, just a couple items of housekeeping. I hope that you can join me on September 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Of course, it's virtual. It's the Future Food Tech Conference. I'm just one of the speakers. I'm hosting a roundtable on how to get your communication strategy right as a building brand. Uh, so that is October 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, futurefoodtech.com. Go to them. It's two days of fabulous speakers, certainly not just me by any means. So you can really listen to a lot of wonderful speakers about building your brand, building your business, and new innovation in the food veg tech area. And then on October 3rd, I'll be speaking at vegpreneur.org. Again, another virtual conference again at 10 a.m. And this one is all about building your plant-based brand. I'll be speaking with Robbie Lockie. Uh, he and I are on the same panel with a bunch of other wonderful people to build your brand. That's on October 3rd, vegpreneur.org. Sign up uh, 10 a.m. Both of these are at 10 a.m. Futurefoodtech.com and vegpreneur.org. Okay, let's get into it. I'm going to bring in today's guest, Max Bazerman, author uh, and Harvard business professor. Max, thanks for being with me. I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you for inviting me on the show. Yes, absolutely. So let's get into it. Uh, so very exciting. Your book, Better Not Perfect, is out as of a day or two ago, and <laughs> you are here to talk about it. But I would advocate that while your book starts out saying, look, if we make better decisions for ourselves, if we become better negotiators, we create more value for ourselves. And then by the end of the book, we see that often making that compassionate choice is actually the better decision. And then in better decision making, we have better financial outcomes and better quality of life, etc. cetera. Um, so before we get into it, let me just say, if you do not know Max Bazerman, he is the author of five books now, The Power of Experiments, The Power of um, Noticing, Judgment in Managerial Decision Making, and Blind Spots Now. Better Not Perfect is his fifth book. He is, as I say, a Harvard business professor. His list of accolades is quite long. I'm not going to read them all, but you can go to his website at Harvard to find out more about him. Um, okay, so I want people to take from this interview some very tactical things. Perhaps you can run me through with all your expertise. And as you say in the book, what makes for a good decision maker? A good decision maker deliberates when they have important decisions to make. So when you go to a grocery store and you already have some general understanding of what you're trying to accomplish, whether it's health or cost efficiency or whatever, you certainly can't deliberate on every single purchase that you make. But when you're making important decisions about who to marry, whether to buy the house, whether to move, whether to take the job, how, to, how you want to lead your lifestyle, um, it's a good time to de to deliberate. There are many people out there who want to tell us that we should trust our intuition. And my reaction, it's great to trust your intuition for small decisions. For the big ones, we're going to make better and it turns out more ethical decisions the more we deliberate and we think clearly about what we're trying to accomplish. I love this answer, but I will say as a bit of devil's advocate, we live in a society of immediate gratification. And what you're talking about usually means taking the longer view. First of all, it means a little bit of self-reflection uh, to know exactly what you want in order to know exactly where you want to go and then to make the decision accordingly. But it also sometimes means a longer view. What do you say about that for individuals and corporations? The longer view is really important. If we want to do what's best for us overall, um, we don't do what creates immediate gratification. That doesn't mean that the, 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 the what we get in over the next half hour is unimportant, but it should be one piece of the deliberation. The notion of I want it now is very dangerous to what you get um, to, to achieve and accomplish and, and consume and enjoy over the course of your lifetime. So um, impatience can be very, very costly. Hmm. Okay. Um, I, I think what struck me as the most impactful, and it's where I am right now, but you also talk about identifying and eliminating waste. So waste, of course, mm -hmm. would mean your time, but your money and also um, products and um, 
waste, just extra um, entities that you don't use. Talk to me about how you can work that into your decision making to be more profitable and have a better quality of life. Sure. So um, we could think of this at a corporate level or, or a personal level. At a corporate level, um, an example I talk about in some detail in the book is Amazon soliciting over 200 different municipalities to bid on who would house the new H2 headquarters. And I found that shockingly wasteful. Uh, undoubtedly, Amazon had a good idea of who the half dozen or perhaps dozen potential locations might be. And to have um, over 200 different munis municipalities spending millions of dollars to create their bids, I think is a shockingly wasteful and unfortunate activity. Um, and I think that uh, Amazon could have achieved everything that they wanted to accomplish without that waste and without the bad press that came along with it. So I think Amazon simply goofed by wasting the resources of so many in the community. Um, in that same chapter, I tell a story about um, a woman named Rachel Atchison, who's a, a vegan activist, a fascinating young woman who I was having lunch with. And, um, and this was at a um, Boston Vegetarian Society lunch. And afterwards, um, when the restaurant had served far more food than can be consumed, and um, after Rachel made sure everybody at the table had what they wanted to take home, she made it clear that she was going to take all the rest of the food home and figure out um, who her eight or 20 friends might be who are going to consume that food that evening. And I found it just observing her behavior to be remarkable because so often we would we, we, we label um, the avoidance of waste is something um, negative. Um, it seemed, some people look down on taking um, food home from a restaurant, but, but the reuse of product in a safe and healthy and valuable way seems like a remarkable positive in terms of um, making the best use of resources and creating more value in society. So whether we think about the individual level or we think about a corporate level, I think we can think of lots of different ways in which we could intervene and be less wasteful and contribute more as a result. So this book is really part business plan, part philosophy, part economics. It's a little bit of everything. It's a good roadmap mm -hmm. for your corporation, but also for the individual. Um, I just want to riff off something about waste before I ask you another question. And I apologize that I didn't copy and paste so that I could quote this directly from the book. But you talk about how many fish are fished from the sea and how many of those fish are actually utilized. It's something, and I'm paraphrasing, I might have it wrong. It's something like 20% of all fish are actually used and consumed and the rest is just wasted. And ultimately that means a waste for our oceans and our environment. And that's how we say it's our bottom line because without a planet, that's obviously no good for us. So talk to me about the waste that you see in the fishing industry. I think it's enormous. I, I think most of the animals that are consumed come through a, a shockingly wasteful process. So in terms of fish, because um, we don't regulate well enough, we end up over overfishing the, the ocean. The, the, the animals are worse off, but so are the fishers long term. This is a good example to your earlier question about impatience. The fishers want the fish now, but if you take all the fish now, there aren't any fish left to create more fish in the future. Um, if you use unsustainable practices in the ocean, then you're going to end up pulling up a, a variety of sea life that don't end up as part of the plate to begin with. And that's, that, that, that's shockingly wasteful. So many vegetarians or vegans may have a problem with um, consuming of animals, but far worse is to catch and basically destroy those animals. And we see similar waste in terms of the production of beef. Um, the statistics on how many calories go into a in, into the creation of beef for the calories that humans can consume is similarly kind of amazing in terms of the of the inefficiency and the value destruction that occurs in the in, in the way we go about producing meat, fish, chicken to put on people's plates.
Mm -hmm. This is why I say we can actually better our bottom line if we are making the compassionate decisions here. So when you look at how inefficient meat and dairy is, I'm quoting the World Resources Institute, give or take nine calories of chicken is is needed to get one calorie back. So by the time you give all that chicken the feed and the water and the feed and the water, you're putting in nine calories to get one calorie back. That's like saying, I'll give you 90 cents for a dime back. Nobody wants to make that business equation. And it is something like 35. I've heard between 30 and 40. So I'll say 35 calories in for that one calorie back of beef. It is so wildly inefficient. And then what is inefficient ends up costing us more. So there's savings to be had, value to be created when you have efficient systems. And here we're seeing more and more that efficient systems often line up with, I'll say, compassionate decisions. Um, and I want to correct myself here, maybe. Sometimes people hear the word compassionate and they say, oh, forget it. I'm not going to listen anymore because this is like a tree hugger la la podcast. And so I'm going to stop using the word compassionate and I'm going to say doing the least harm possible. Because when you do the least harm, you are the least inefficient because you don't have to go back and fix the situation for not being, um, you know, the right situation that you need. Um, I'm, I'm fumbling a little bit of my words, but we talk about fishing as being a great example of this. And you also in the book give the example of Volkswagen that um, ended up just being enormously inefficient by making a decision for themselves uh, that ended up being very costly because they weren't making the compassionate decision right up front. A shockingly unethical set of decisions where Volkswagen intentionally deceived the public, um, particularly environmentally sensitive consumers, to buy a shockingly polluting vehicle in, uh, in the most enormously unethical ways um, we've seen in corporate America in recent years. And seemingly, granted hindsight is twenty twenty, but seemingly very clearly not a good financial decision. You you think they would have seen that one coming. Although I guess we're back to short term logic where the, perhaps the uh, executive board was thinking, well, at least on our watch, we'll have good numbers. Or they thought that they would get away with it. And that ended yeah. up not being wrong. But in terms of the inefficiency of animals, you know, I think part of the hope of the plant based product movement is that um, with more and more experience, they're going to create not just tastier and tastier products that are compassionate, but also um, less expensive products in the long term as they're able to bring the cost down with, with new products that are simply more efficient with the calories that are used um, to create the products that we eventually consume. Yes, there's a university study from Michigan uh, about the Beyond Burger where it saves 99%, uses 99% less water, 93% less land, 90% less grass, <laughs> greenhouse gas emissions, and 40% less energy. These are all savings, and then these all translate into, ultimately, as they scale up, better pricing and so better value for the consumer. Um, not to mention that, you know, meat and dairy have healthcare costs, both from an individual standpoint, as we spend money on pills and doctors, etc. And then from a healthcare management standpoint, um, these are very expensive for people. So um, meat and dairy, I think is going to go the way of tobacco. What do you think about that? Because I know you have a history with the tobacco industry. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the tobacco industry. Um, so, um, I, I, so I think the, I mean, in tobacco, we saw use fall off the cliff starting in the 80s when people became very concerned about secondhand smoke. Um, and whether we're going to see the same rapid decline in the in the consumption of animals, I, I think you might be a little optimistic, but I certainly expect dramatic reductions over the long term. And oh, I think we see that. I mean, plant-based plant -based products are growing at 20% a year, roughly, for a very long period of time. And if that simply continues, we're going to see a dramatic long-term trend. The, I don't, I, I'm not sure the curve's going to look like tobacco, but I think it's going to be a terrific curve. And I think we see that occurring already. And people who are just trying new plant-based products are just stunned by how much they've improved 
over time. And between um, between vegetarians, vegans, flexitarians, reducitarians, meatless Monday people, um, the growth has been phenomenal. And if that trend comes close to continuing, and I think it will, um, we're talking about long-term dramatic changes. I'll throw out a couple statistics here. So a recent survey from the Guru Food Service says that about 3% of people surveyed, over 31,000 people were surveyed, 3% are vegan, about 11% are vegetarian, and 20% are flexitarians, this group that is looking to take out the meat and put in more vegetables and keep this veg heavy flex diet. So you add those together and you have 33% about of the world, a third of the world, give or take, is now working out the meat. Um, so it's it's very exciting to see this. And COVID has indeed been a bit of a tailwind for plant-based foods as people are more concerned about meat, where it's yeah. come from, how it's produced. There was an ADM, um, Archer Daniels Midland research uh, report that said 18% of people tried plant-based options during COVID. And of that 18%, 92% decided to stay with them in the long term. So you're seeing more and more people taste them, try them, and stick with them. So I think those numbers are only going to grow in the future. I think but so. And, and I think a lot of people see investment opportunities in the plant-based world. Um, so there's founders who want to create products. There's investors who want to invest in those founders. And there's more and more reception from consumers. So overall, it's a pretty dramatic combination. Um, and, and I think one of the things that I find fascinating about this movement is that a a many of the founders, many of the investors are vegan, yet they're amazingly receptive to the flexitarians and reducitarians because they realize that the path toward success for these products is to get people to be better, even if they can't get to what they might perceive to be perfect. Yes, right back to your book, Better Not Perfect. But I love what you say about that. I'll go back to some statistics. Um, in 2020, the first quarter had more venture capital investment than all of 2019 put together for plant-based items. So to show you that the money is pouring in as we look for a solution so that our food supply system is not only safer, but much more efficient. When you have a more efficient food supply system, then you have the possibility of feeding the world when you go from 7 billion to 10 billion people. It's just not possible to feed 10 billion people on an inefficient system that we have now. There's just, it would require too many trees being cut down to grow too many grains that do we give these grains to people? the grains that have uh, fiber and protein. No, we give them to animals and then we give the animals land and water and time and land and water and time and more grain. And it's just very, very inefficient. So um, I think a lot of people are looking for a financial solution to that problem for our food safety and security. Um, but also, I just want to comment again, one more statistic. So I was saying 3% are vegan, 11% are vegetarian. Those numbers are pretty constant. The number that's growing is that 20% flexitarian. Absolutely. That is the, so indeed it is meat eaters who are looking for a healthier answer. Yeah. So um, I, I kind of entered the plant-based food world um, in about two and a half years ago. I've been a vegetarian since 1993, but I was attending a talk um, two and a half years ago. By, uh, I was giving a talk at an effective altruism conference, and the speaker before me was Bruce Friedrich. And um, and that talk changed a good chunk of my life, um, where he basically highlighted the data that you're, that you're providing, that we we haven't May, we haven't been effective at making the moral argument that you should be vegetarian or vegan because that percentage has been remarkably stable. Yet you have 20% compounded growth in terms of plant-based products. Um, where does that come from? That comes from the fact that this world that that is heavily influenced by vegans is dramatically receptive to helping people be better even if they're not going to be perfect and there are many sort of people out there who have ethical views and they basically take the attitude if you don't match my views you're ethically deficient and one of the things that i find fascinating about um the the plant-based food movement is the receptivity of bringing people along where the consumer is now rather than where we think that they should be. And and to be honest, the 
title, Better Not Perfect, it was heavily influenced by what I learned from Bruce Friedrich and this overall movement of people um, who have very strong compassion for animals, but they want to do the most good they can rather than simply school people for not re reaching the level of perfection that they want. So I, I find the, this world fascinating in its practicality in achieving the objective of reducing as much animal suffering as possible, but relying on people who aren't going to buy into the vegan or vegetarian goals in a complete and total way. Mm -hmm. I love that you say that. Again, you're talking about Bruce Friedrich from the Good Food Institute, gfi.org, a wonderful organization filled with information. Um, and I agree with you. I love the approach that the Good Food Institute takes in that they are basically trying to find the most efficient food system, which, oh, hey, just happens to be the compassionate one for animals, but also people and the planet. It's really looking at the long-term view. We talk about this better, not perfect. You talk about making decisions for the long-term view. It looks at the long-term view for our healthcare system, for animals, for the safety of our food supply system, which has had problems during COVID, and for our planet. Um, one of the things you talk about in the book, which I want to get at, is how can we make decisions despite some of our biases that just mm -hmm. happen to be due to the culture where we grew up, our innate personal biases, perhaps. So you talk about reducing tribalism and looking at decisions from an equality standpoint. Talk to me more about that because I think that is a tricky place for people. Sure. So um, so my thoughts here are heavily influenced by Peter Singer, who I know you've interviewed in the past, mm. and my colleague at Harvard, Josh Green. Um, and Josh has written a terrific book called Moral Tribes. Um, and um, what, what I think, what they both encourage us to do, and I completely endorse, is to at least become aware of the degree to which we Maybe may have favoritism to some group based on our own identity, and this could be favoritism to people um, in our family, which most of us would endorse. But it may also be based on did they go to the same college that I went to? Are they a member of the same religion as uh, as I'm a member of? Um, are they from the same nationality? That from the same ethnicity? And um, and Singer does a terrific job highlighting the fact that the more we privilege the interests of some people over the interests of others, we're, we're sort of implicitly being racist as a result. And he then, as, as you know, in his work on animal liberation, he makes the further argument that when we privilege humans over other species, um, species, speciesism, speci being speciest is simply an extension of this in-group favor favoritism or tribalism. And none of us are going to get to the point where um, we aren't tribal at all. And, 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 and we would look at somebody who didn't favor people in their own family as being morally deficient in other ways. But I think most of us could look at the ways in which we favor some groups over other groups. And if we could move to a sort of a greater focus on the equality of the interests of all, that would improve our ethicality and, again, allow us to be better, even if we couldn't be perfect. Yes. Uh, you go ahead and quote in your book Jeremy Bentham, who um, made this original comment, although Peter Singer really popularized it. The question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? So this idea that all suffering is equal. And so as you, of course, want to eliminate your own suffering and the suffering of your family around you, it's still not a bad idea to incorporate in your decision making who else suffers. So we're back to do the least harm possible. Who else is suffering from the result of this decision? That's right. And, and, and it's important to note that Bentham Mill Singer um, when, when they talk about the equality of the interests of all, they're not saying that an insect is as important as a human being. They're simply saying that the suffering of any sent sentient being should, um, should count in a, in a similar way. So we should care about the suffering of all in a similar way, not that all creatures are of equal value um, for, for a wide variety of reasons. 
Yes. And it's also, you know, I think it's overwhelming when you look at the world's issues that we have going on now. And we are living in turbulent times, as we know, to say like, oh my gosh, I have to do more. I can, a lot of people are just struggling to get by themselves. So it's, it's hard, I think, to have them think about other people. Honestly, I'm sorry to say that. But if we can reframe it to perhaps not taking on all the world's issues at once, because it is quite overwhelming, but just doing the least harm possible and factoring that into every decision that you make and factoring that into every purchasing decision that you make because your dollars do speak so loudly. I, I think that that's right. But I, I would say that all of us um, sort of have opportunities to create more good when it wouldn't be very expensive for us. All of us have the opportunity to create less harm when it wouldn't be all that expensive to us. In many cases, it simply requires thinking and deliberating about your choice of various activities. So um, in the book, I, I talk a fair amount about time as a resource. So people often think of money as the resource that they need to think about how to allocate. Yet, if you ask people what are they short of, short of in life, they often tell you time. And um, I'm inspired by my colleague at uh, Carnegie Mellon, Linda Babcock, um, who's, uh, who's a very famous academic um, and important, she's had important administrative roles in her university. Um, and she's female. And she notes that um, females in universities are often called on to do more tasks than males, sometimes for good for good intent. Uh, the university wants female representation on a variety of committees. And um, one of the things that she noted was, even if I want to do the most good I can for the university, if I simply say yes to tasks to be, to be nice, that means that I don't have time to do good in other ways. We don't have unlimited amounts of time. So sometimes we say yes to a task and we end up doing that task. We create some good, but the fact is we could have used that same scarce resource, our time, to do far more good in some different ways. So as I talk to you, I'm 65 years old. And when I turned 50, my birthday present to myself was I quit four different editorial boards. So wow. academics often review peer review papers. They sit on academic uh, on, on editorial boards. If you sit on an editorial board, you review more papers. And for my 50th birthday, I kind of reviewed what things in my life would I rather not be doing? And turns out that taken as a group, those papers were something that I didn't particularly enjoy doing. But more importantly, they probably weren't the best use of my time, even if my goal was to be a good citizen and to help others. That there were um, younger scholars available who would find the task intriguing, who would be paying more attention, probably would do a better job than I would. And so for my 50th birthday a present to myself, I quit the four editorial boards. And you could sit, think of that as an act of defection. Um, and perhaps it was, but I don't think so. I think I was able to then harness that time and do more good in some very uh, different ways. I find this so empowering, which is why I encourage everyone to get better, not perfect, because this is really the area of the book that I was taking personally to heart. I think there's other areas that might speak to other people, but this is the words that I needed to hear right when I read the chapter about using your time most efficiently. I am taking that to heart, and I'm going to be making some birthday presents for myself, even if it's not my birthday. Uh, it's, I've got to say no to things. I've just got to. So I, I should also add, I'm inspired by an organization called 80,000 Hours, which is part of the effective altruism movement, which tends to focus on younger people who are making career choices and encouraging them to think about where their 80,000 future hours of work can do the most good. And I think it's a terrific organization. It's a terrific thing for young people to be thinking about. But I think that we can all think about our, the use of our time in terms of creating more good in the world. Um, and th there are so many different ways to do that. I think um, when, when at 50, when I audited my life to see what tasks could I change, it wasn't hard to find ways to reallocate time 
um, so that I could be both happier and do more good in the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I love how this really did hit home for me also in the book, Better Not Perfect. This concept of doing more good in the world is not in conflict with doing more good for yourself. These things actually often run in parallel. And that's why I say you can better your bottom line by making these do less harm kind of choices. What is good for you is also good for the world usually. So I yeah. so so my my spouse became a vegetarian three years before I did. So in nineteen ninety she became a vegetarian. And um so you could view that as a sacrifice, but uh, along with becoming a vegetarian, um she paid much more attention to the food she ate and to cooking. And um and as a result of her vegetarianism, my quality of food went up dramatically simply because she was thinking about it more. So the animals were better off, Marla was better off, and it turns out I was better off as her spouse because I got to eat better food, even though I wasn't a committed vegetarian at that point. So you, you can see how we can do more good and often create more enjoyment for ourselves and those around us. So let's talk about that. You talk about nudging in the book about, um, you know, how to exponentially make your good have a ripple effect. So um, here you have Marla, your wife who goes vegetarian. And the ripple effect from that is there's an environmental benefit. There's an animal benefit. There's a health benefit for her. And then, oh, lo and behold, you get all those things as well. So talk to me about that nudging effect. Sure. So, um, so, um, so Better Not Perfect came out this week. The next book that will come out, maybe a year and a half, two years from now, um, with my excellent colleague Don Moore at uh, UC Berkeley, will be about decision leadership. And, Great. and an important part of that is going to be that what makes leaders different than other important decision makers, so physicians are important, lawyers are important, but what makes leaders different, not better, but different, is that the fact is the fact that they're responsible not only for their own decisions, but for the decisions of other people. And uh, leaders might mean um, teachers, particularly K through 12 teachers who can influence a wide variety of young people, could be parents, but it could also be leaders of typical not-for-profit or for-profit organiza or government organizations where leaders um, can ha can have an effect on others. And sometime, sometimes it's by the norms that they create, um, but sometimes it's through the use of wise behavioral science. So um, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein wrote a book called Nudge, which has really revolutionized the field of behavioral economics by focusing on how we design the choice architecture around us can influence the decision that lots and lots and lots of people make. So. Um, where um, where is the beef located in the cafeteria, and where are the where are the, where's the vegetables located, and um, and do, where do we put the healthy food, and where do we put the unhealthy food? It turns out we can have a dramatic influence um, on the decisions that, that we make. Um, a famous example of nudging is in the world of organ donation, where um, Johnson and Goldstein showed that European countries that forced you to sign up to be in the organ donation system had dramatically, not slightly, dramatically lower donation rates than countries that basically mm. declared by law, you're in the, do the organ donation system unless you sign out saying that I don't want my organs to be no donated. So the default ends up having a dramatic effect on what we do. Um, what's easily available has a dramatic effect of what we do. The norms that we create has have a dramatic effect on what we do. So the wise leader who can structure the environment, and again, by wise leader, I'm including parents who can structure, who can structure the house, can have a dramatic effect on the wisdom of the decisions of other people. And we want to be aware of that. And, and I want to reiterate some of the things that people can learn from your book, Better Not Perfect, when one who is in a decision-making capacity actually takes that long-term view and not the tribal view, you end up creating these long-term decisions that can have a, an effect on, you know, generations 
that is better and more efficient the first time around. So if we made some of these default decisions, let's say to have veggies up front in a buffet, you'd see people picking more veggies decade after decade, relying and eating more veggies. This would be better for the environment, better for our health, and we wouldn't have to go back and fix it later. And now we're finding that our food system doesn't work for us. Our planet is on the brink and we're having to go back and reinvent the wheel. But if we had done it just with a longer viewpoint earlier on, perhaps we wouldn't be wasting this time and effort and money redoing our system. And we might want to make those veggies taste really good so that those people who are on a toward the path toward plant-based foods are become more and more enthusiastic about it. Yes. And we're doing that right now. You're seeing that in the good food movement, as you say. Absolutely. Um, everybody knows about Beyond Meat, but oh, hey, it's not just Beyond Meat. There's lots of great food products out there yeah. and more and more every day. And hats off to all the young entrepreneurs doing it. So, uh, so the amazing thing about Beyond Meat is, one, they don't need most of most of the rest of us to invest in them. I think that the action is on all the startups who are going to be the next generation. But at the same time, you know, the the IPO that that turned Beyond Meat public um, has just been phenomenal for increasing the visibility of the plant based movement more broadly. So you mentioned that COVID ha has had an impact, um, and I think you're undoubtedly right. I think that another important impact is the f dramatic financial success of Beyond Meat. So um, yeah, I, I was not an investor in Beyond Meat, and I'm still delighted to see it occur, um, even if my focus is more on newer firms um, rather than the established, the, the two enormous established brands. Mm -hmm. And I will say a shout out to the Glasswall Syndicate that does focus on bringing in investors to take part in these other brands that are helping to shape the grocery store, really, uh, because it's not just Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat. Obviously, there are many, many. So, so if I could elaborate, uh, Elizabeth. Um, so Elizabeth and I are both part of the Glasswall Syndicate. That's actually how we met. So I've, I've seen her on a number of uh, pitch sessions. So the Glasswall Syndicate is um, 150, 175, I'm not sure I have the, uh, the latest count, of um, small to large investors in the plant-based world. And one of the things that I found fascinating about the, the Glasswall Group, um, um, uh, led by Lisa Feria and Macy Marriott, um, is the degree of cooperation where mm -hmm. Glasswall members might decide that they're that they're not in, interested in investing in a particular founder, but if they know who other investors would be that might be more interested, they, they're more than happy to facilitate a cooperative effort to help this movement grow. And it's a level of cooperation because of the underlying mission of reducing animal suffering that creates a cooperative investment environment that I can't imagine in any other industry. So I, I actually find it a fascinating community because from its ability to create value simply by creating a more cooperative spirit among the various members. And you are right. There is value created there. Again, hats off to Stray Dog Capital, Lisa Feria, and then, of course, Macy Marriott with Glasswall Syndicate. Uh, there is value created there because of that sense of cooperation, which makes it easier for these deals to come together because everyone's taking part in some of the work. And so more businesses get funded that way. And then you have more products out there, more co consumers can buy, and more animals are replaced in the food system, which is better for the environment. And if you have children, that means better for your family. So, you know, this all really is very linked, but, you know, not everyone has time or perhaps the financial wherewithal definitely understood uh, to invest themselves. And it does take time if you want to do this kind of grassroots mm -hmm. investing. Um, what about, I'll say for lack of a better expression, uh, farming it out to uh, an ESG you know, your, your person at Merrill Lynch or your person at Fidelity, and they find you an ESG fund. Um, what is your, what are your tips if you have uh, for anyone wanting to invest in ESG and or um, other compassionately minded funds? So I, I'm not presenting myself to your audience as a finance professor. So a hundred percent. Correct. So you're, you're getting an answer from um, a decision-making negotiation professor who has been spending a fair amount of time in the world of ethics lately. And um, 
And uh, so what, what I would say is, uh, well, my background before I ran into this plant-based investment world, I invested most of our, our extra assets in index funds. So I didn't spend a lot of time getting advice from a lot of sources. I didn't pay a lot of intermediaries for that advice. And I think broadly, there's lots of evidence um, that index funds are a shockingly good way to invest. But but obviously, that's not going to get you into um, kind of the startup world where, where you find the plant-based movement. Um, so I tend, so one of the things that I find striking about the Glasswall Syndicate, um, and, I, and I appreciate the fact that it's not available um, to, to everybody, um, is the fact that you have like-minded people who are giving you advice who um, aren't necessarily making a commission off of it. So, so I lean toward how would you engage with the effective altruism community? How would you engage with um, various food movements and find other like-minded people to think through opportunities with you, as opposed to finding people who have a financial incentive in you making specific decisions. But I'm a little bit more skeptical of intermediaries than, than many, but, but, but I would look for like-minded people rather than professional intermediaries. Mm -hmm. And there are actually a lot of groups like this on Facebook, et cetera, um, just meetup groups, investing meetup groups. I think it's interesting. What I am enjoying seeing with the interest in ESG funds is that this idea of doing good seems to be collectively as a whole, and I could have this wrong, I'd love your opinion, less something that people are thinking, I live my life all day long, and then, oh, 3%, I'll throw to charity. This extra add-on later, this afterthought. And it's becoming aligned with how people move through the world in general. Investing for a lot of people is something they do every day, or they watch the markets maybe every week, if not every day, or you know they're in tune to this, and they think about their investment plan, and what are they going to do when they're 65, and they're no longer going to be working, and how are they going to fund that? And this idea of making money through better corporate governance and environmental interests is really aligning what you're saying in your book. When you start to make decisions with that longer term effect, you have these positive outcomes for yourself. And it seems that that is taking place now. So if this show, if this segment or your show more broadly encourage people to think about their values as they invest, I think that that's simply a terrific thing. I, I was responding more in the earlier question to the use of intermediaries who may not have the exact same preferences that you have. So um, I, I have invested in stray dog capital and you can view stray dog capital as an intermediary. Um, and I, and I did it because I wanted to learn from this new world. Um, and so that was worth the costs of intermediation, but more broadly, I think, I would ra I would now rather talk to you and the many other members of Gla of the Glasswall Syndicate to get ideas about how to invest rather than a broker. Certainly, rather than a broker who has a much broader set of investment interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which makes total sense to me. Let's talk about really sort of the culmination of the book, and I want to make sure I get this um, directly from you. What do you mean by maximum sustainable goodness? And that really is where you wrap up the book, Better Not Perfect. Well, uh, thanks for that. That's a terrific question. Um, so um, we often hear the notion of maximal, uh, maximal sustainable yield in the environmental world. And, um, and when, I had, when I wrote a draft of this book, um, and I ended up talking with a philosopher from the University of Vermont who was visiting at Harvard by the name of Mark Boulderson. And I described my book to him. Um, we had a very pleasant conversation. He left my office. I, I didn't have any specific plans to see him again. And he sent me an email. And in the email, he wrote, I, it strikes me that what you're talking about in this book is helping people become better, not perfect, so that they can reach their maximum sustainable level of goodness. And when I read it, I said, 
sort of this young philosopher has captured the essence. And I said to him, may, may I steal this term? And he said, absolutely. So I've been using the term maximal sustainable goodness in connection to this book ever since. And it, um, it, it's a core concept in the closing chapter. Um, and it's part of the subtitle um, that 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 took a little bit of doing. So not everybody in the publishing industry found found that term fascinating. I do. I like it. I think it describes what we're trying to accomplish um, to a remarkable degree. Mm -hmm. And to sum up for people, you really are trying to get people to make the best decisions they can for themselves so that they have this maximal sustainable goodness. Without trying to push them to a level that they would not find acceptable or sustainable. So even if we got the positive behavior out of them, it wouldn't last over time. So again, I'm a big fan of a long-term perspective. We want a sustainable level rather than simply good behavior. Mm -hmm. And you do see this a lot also in the good food, good food movement, as you say, people saying like, hey, Meatless Monday, it's better than not Meatless Monday. Absolutely. You know, And if Meatless Monday becomes Meatless Monday, Wednesday, Friday, well, then you've got momentum there and a body in motion stays in motion. And it's just important to get on the path. <laughs> and from there, you, you go as far as you can along that path. But it's, it's not about running the marathon. It's about making every individual mile. At least that's how I see it for myself. Sounds terrific. You're on the path toward your maximum, maximum sustainable goodness. And I'm only on that path because I've read Better, Not Perfect by Max Bazerman. Okay, so I have one quick exit question, sort of quick exit question for you. Of course, nobody knows the future, and I'm sure you're going to say, oh, it's all plant-based. But if you could give us your predictions for the next three to five years, I'd love to hear it. And that could be about the good food movement, or that could be about how people are making their decisions. <laughs> Well, I certainly hope that that future includes uh, President Biden creating a wide variety of important changes. Okay. Um, so the number of ways in which value has been destroyed in terms of um, reduced um, relationships with our allies, um, the destruction of inter international trade, um, the harm to specific targeted communities is just stunning. So there's enormous opportunity to create value by simply electing um, a much wiser president. So, uh, so that's, that's the first one, and that's only um, a few months away. Um, but beyond that, I think that um, there's lots of opportunity to see greater justice in the world. And we, there's another movement going on um, that I think will lead us to a more just society. Um, but I think that that will expand, and, and as it expands, it moves into the into the world of this uh, of, of this hour, um, which is uh, the world of plant based food, and and not only equality for humans, but greater equality for other species, um, and that uh, probably means not killing them to eat them. Um, at least as much as we have been in the past. And hopefully um, we could see a dramatic change in that. Um, I think all the evidence for the future is just terrific. Um, we have more and more amazing products coming on the line. We have more and more investors who want to get involved in this world. So we have founders um, creating new product. We have investors who are happy to uh, fund their growth. And we have um, consumers who want to eat 20% more of these products every year. Mm -hmm. And when you compound 20% growth, that's a remarkable change that we can see over the next three to five years. I would agree. I think it's actually a very encouraging time. I think people are feeling more empowered than ever to take back control of their lives and their health and the health of the planet. And in making those better decisions for themselves, ultimately, they make better decisions for animals and the planet and their future. So I do think um, you mentioned politics. I'll just say I think people on both sides of the aisle are fed up with politics. And I'm hoping that this encourages them to think about the decisions they make for themselves rather than shopping it out to others, and that that will have a more positive effect effect as we roll on down the years. Um, Max, I see you wanted to say one more thing before we're out. So, so there are politics involved, and I never would have voted for President Trump. Um, however, I, I think separate from politics, we can look at the wisdom of the ma managing of COVID, the wisdom of, of destroying the international trading system, and see just a series of value-destroying events independent of what your normal politics might be. So I think that we have tremendous opportunity and I hope that we move in a dramatically better direction moving forward.
Everybody use your purchasing power to shift the world. Every time you reach for that food on your plate three times a day, you are actually making impactful decisions. So when you use your purchasing power to align with your values, I do think you're going to see a change in the world. And that's just one simple decision you make three times a day that can actually have a long standing impact. Max Bazerman's book, Better, not perfect, everybody. If you were thinking about how to better utilize your time, that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, you're going to find this book very, very instructing. Of course, there's also um, tips for better negotiating strategies, etc. And just kind of looking at your life and thinking, "Ooh, how can I be a bit more efficient so that the decisions I make and the actions I have have a better impact for me, the planet, animals, and everybody else along the way. So Max, I am so appreciative that you're here. This interview came together last minute, so good for us. Uh, your book, Better Not Perfect, Amazon.com, right? That's where everyone should get it? That'll, that'll, that'll work just fine. And thank you so much for this uh, conversation and thank, thanks at all you brought to the conversation. Appreciate it, Elizabeth. Oh, don't go away, Max. You stay right here. Everybody else, the Plant-Based Business Hour is back on Tuesday. Have a wonderful weekend. I will see you next Tuesday at 1 o'clock. Max, stay put. Bye, everybody.